From Birth to Death, the complete story of Apostle Peter. Why do you hate Peter so much? Because his claims are ridiculous. The life of Apostle Peter was one of intrigue and transformation. Peter, born Simon, the son of Jonah, started life in the backdrop of the Galilean Sea in Bethsaida, a bustling fishing village intersecting Jewish and Gentile territories. Simon lived a life of obscurity and anonymity in this Roman outpost by the Sea of Galilee. However, all that would change when he met a man whose message he would latter dedicate his life to spreading around the year 30 CE. Simon's name and value would change, but not so much by the work of his hands, but by his connection to the man who would later redeem the world. About three years after the birth of Jesus to the Virgin Mary, Simon, who later become his rock, was born to a simple peasant named Jonah and his wife. Like most Jewish babies born at the time, there was no expectation for this child beyond a life of peasantry and subsistence under the iron rule of the Roman Empire. When Simon was born around 1 BCE, it was into a world of frenetic political and religious tension, which was to shape his character and life profoundly. Simon was by no means docile. He was highly temperamental. Raised in a culture dominated by fishing and trade, Simon adopted a robust and assertive demeanor from an early age, necessary for survival in his world. When Simon was still a boy, his father, Jonah, started an informal fishing partnership with Zebedee. Zebedee is related to the woman who would later become Simon's wife. Zebedee was also the father of Simon's close friend, John, another prominent disciple of Jesus. These relationships shows the interconnected nature of their community. The fishing industry in Bethsaida was not a small-scale operation. It was an important industry under heavy Roman control and taxation. Fishermen like Simon were viewed with suspicion and often categorized as unsavory. Around the age of 25, Simon married a woman from his hometown. To meet the demands of the Roman fishing industry, he relocated with his wife and children to Capernaum, a vibrant port town. It was here, around 27 CE, that Simon, his brother Andrew, and their in-laws first encountered the revolutionary teachings of John the Baptist on the banks of the Jordan River. Simon and many who heard the Baptist found him intriguing. But Simon's obligation as a fisherman afforded him little luxury of being taken in by a message with a primary focus on the afterlife. His reality was the present, how to survive the harsh truth of the Roman oppression. But it was different for Andrew, his brother. Andrew was deeply moved by John's message and joined the movement, leaving Simon and others to manage the fishing business. Little did Simon know at the time that his lukewarm attitude towards God and religion was about to be radically transformed. The turning point in Simon's life came with the arrival of Jesus of Nazareth. One day, as Andrew was following John, he witnessed the arrival of Jesus, who was baptized by John, and declared the Lamb of God. Andrew was astounded. Perhaps Andrew recalled Genesis 22, in which the binding of Isaac foretells the gospel of Jesus Christ. In that story, when Isaac asked his father Abraham, Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham responded, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Genesis 22, 7-8 and now here in the presence of the world, John the Baptist, and a foremost prophet of God, is declaring this unassuming man to be the Lamb of God. No wonder Andrew was stunned. So Andrew followed Jesus for a while and listened to his teachings. What he heard convinced him that John the Baptist was on to something. Not longer after, Andrew convinced his brother, Simon, to meet Jesus. Simon, Skeptical at first, did not take too long to see Jesus' divine authority in action. When Jesus first met Simon, he was disappointed and downcast with an empty fishing boat after many hours in the deep sea. He was to go home empty-handed. The book of Luke described what happened next. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, We've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, 
I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. Luke 5 verses 4 to 9. It was not only Simon that recognized the authority of Jesus in that first encounter. Jesus also recognized the strength of Simon. He invited Simon to follow him and promised to make him fisher of men. Simon's hesitation was all gone by now. He lay down his fishing net and followed Jesus. Not long after, Jesus will make a major pronouncement on his vision for Simon. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Matthew 16, 13-20 This incident signaled the ascent of Simon, now Peter, the rock of Jesus, into leadership and prominence. But the journey would not be straightforward and easy. It will be full of turbulence, and it will require the utmost of perseverance. Peter's transformation was profound as he left his fishing business, family, and security to follow Jesus. He was effectively aligning himself with a new revolution that opposed the oppressive Roman regime as well as the unbending Orthodox Council of the Sanhedrin. Peter witnessed and participated in numerous miracles with Jesus, from the wedding at Canaan where water was turned into wine to the healing of his mother-in-law. These events solidified his belief in Jesus as the Messiah. However, Peter's journey was not without trials and doubts. The first was his experience of a brief but significant crisis of faith during a storm on the Sea of Galilee. It happened after the miracle of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Jesus sent Peter and the other disciples ahead in a boat while he remained to pray. However, later at night, the disciples rode into a storm on the Sea of Galilee. As they struggled against the wind and waves, they see a figure walking towards them on the water. Terrified, they believed it to be a ghost. Sensing their fear, Jesus immediately reassured them, saying, It is I. Do not be afraid. It was then that Peter asks Jesus, saying, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus grants his request and invites him. Peter then steps out of the boat and begins to walk on the water towards Jesus. However, in the middle of the walk, Peter notices the strong wind. He becomes frightened, quickly begins to sink in the water. He cries out to Jesus, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reaches out his hand and catches Peter. It is on this occasion Jesus offered the famous word. He said to Peter, You of little faith, why did you doubt? After this incident, they then climb into the boat, and the wind ceased. For Peter, this incident was a critical lesson in faith and trust. Another pivotal moment for Peter in his time with Jesus is his experience of the transfiguration. It happened when one day, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to a high mountain, often identified as Mount Tabor by historians. While on the mountain, Jesus is transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes become as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appear and began to talk with Jesus. This symbolizes the law, Moses, and the prophets, Elijah, bearing witness to Jesus as the Messiah. Peter, often impulsive, 
reacts by offering to make three shelters, or tabernacles, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While Peter is still speaking, a bright cloud envelops them, and a voice from the cloud says, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. The disciples are terrified and fall face down to the ground. Afterward, Jesus comes to them, touches them, and tells them not to be afraid. As they look up, they see no one except Jesus. He instructs them not to tell anyone what they have seen until after his resurrection from the dead. There are many reasons for this instruction. However, the main reason is because Jesus had not finished preparing the disciples for what would follow after the revelation. Despite these profound experiences, Peter's understanding of Jesus' mission was still evolving. He struggled to reconcile his expectations of a liberating Messiah with Jesus' predictions of suffering and death. One day, towards the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus begins to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter, taken aback by this revelation, takes Jesus aside and begins to say to him, saying, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Then Jesus turns to Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, it is important to note that Jesus was speaking to whatever spirit was instigating Peter to say those words. Jesus knows that Peter was no Satan. Peter's reaction was out of love and concern for Jesus. But it was also based on a misunderstanding of Jesus' mission and the nature of his kingdom. The climax of Peter's discipleship came during the Last Supper, the last meal Jesus shared with his twelve disciples. Jesus announces that one of them will betray him. This creates a sense of unease and questioning among the disciples. Then, Peter felt the need to assert his unwavering loyalty to Jesus. He told Jesus that he would never betray or deny him, even if it means death for him. In response, Jesus tells Peter that before the rooster crows the next morning, Peter will deny knowing him three times. Not long after, Jesus was arrested. The incident occurs in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus went to pray after the Last Supper. Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, arrives with a detachment of soldiers and officials from the chief priests and Pharisees to arrest Jesus, again giving in to his impulsivity, as the soldiers move to arrest Jesus, Peter takes a sword and strikes the high priest's servant by the name of Malchus, cutting off his right ear. Jesus immediately rebukes Peter, telling him to put away his sword. It was here he uttered the profoundly revealing statement, All those who draw the sword will die by the sword. Jesus then touches the servant's ear and heals him, demonstrating his commitment to nonviolence and compassion even in the face of betrayal and arrest. That same night, Peter, along with other disciples, followed Jesus at a distance as he is taken to the high priest's house for trial. While in the courtyard of the high priest, a servant girl recognizes Peter as one of Jesus' followers and said so to him. Peter, however, denies it, saying, I don't know him. This happened on two other occasions, and Peter had similar response. Immediately after the third denial, a rooster crows, fulfilling what Jesus had predicted at the Last Supper. This realization strikes Peter profoundly as he remembers Jesus' words. Struck by guilt and sorrow, Peter leaves the scene weeping bitterly. We do not know where Peter was when Jesus was on the cross. After the incident of Peter denying Jesus, the Gospels do not mention him again until after the resurrection of Jesus. This suggests that, like most of the other disciples, he may have been in hiding for fear of being arrested or persecuted for his association with Jesus. While this may seem cowardice, but this period was a period of extreme fear, confusion, and despair for the disciples, who were grappling with the arrest and crucifixion of their leader. Three days after Jesus was crucified and buried, Mary Magdalene and the other women went to the tomb early in the morning to anoint his body 
but found the stone door rolled away from the tomb and the body of Jesus missing. Jesus later appeared to Mary Magdalene and instructs her to tell the disciples of his resurrection. Mary did as she was instructed. Upon hearing the news, Peter, accompanied by John, runs to the tomb to see for himself, but Jesus was not there. Later, Jesus appears to the disciples, including Peter, on various occasions. One significant encounter took place by the Sea of Galilee. Peter and several other disciples had gone fishing overnight, but caught nothing. At dawn, Jesus stood on the shore of the sea. At first, the disciples did not recognize him. Then Jesus spoke to them. He told them to cast their net on the right side of the boat. This resulted in a large catch of fish. The disciples were stunned. It was at this moment that John recognized Jesus. He then told Peter, saying, It is the Lord. Upon hearing this, Peter, in his characteristic impulsive manner, wrapped his outer garment around him and jumped into the water to swim to shore while the others followed in the boat. Once on shore, they found Jesus with a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. Jesus invited them to bring some of the fish they had caught and then gave them bread and fish to eat. This was one of the post-resurrection appearances where Jesus shared a meal with his disciples. After they had finished eating, Jesus had a significant conversation with Peter. He asked Peter three times, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Each time Peter affirmed his love, and Jesus responded with a command, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, and feed my sheep. This conversation highlights the forgiveness and restoration of Peter and sets the stage for his leadership role in the early Christian church. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples, including Peter, over a period of 40 days. In one of these appearances, he gathered them together and gave his final instructions. He told them to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit. He also commissioned them to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After giving these instructions, Peter and the other disciples watched in awe as Jesus was taken up before their very eyes. A cloud hid him from their sight as he ascended into heaven. While they were gazing upward, two angels dressed in white appeared beside them and asked, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Following this, Peter returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, as instructed by Jesus. There, they joined together in prayer and preparation, awaiting the coming of the Holy Spirit, marking the beginning of his leadership of the early Christian church. After Jesus' ascension, the disciples, including Peter, returned to Jerusalem and gathered in an upper room. They were united in prayer as they awaited the Holy Spirit. Not long after, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the entire house. And then, what appeared to be tongues of fire rested on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, which enabled them to speak in different languages. Afterward, Peter stood to address the faithful. He delivered a powerful sermon, explaining that what they were witnessing was the fulfillment of God's promise and prophecy. He spoke of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, declaring him to be both Lord and Christ. That day, about 3,000 people accepted his message and were baptized. This marked the birth of the early Christian church. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. The Complete Story of Apostle Peter After the Ascension of Jesus The story of Jesus' ministry on earth cannot be complete without the mention of Simon, who later became Peter. After the ascension of Jesus, the role of the leader and nurturer of the early church fell on Peter. Peter's many stumbles notwithstanding, after his leadership began, he was exemplary and steadfast in his commitment to spreading the message of salvation with which he was tasked by Jesus. One of Peter's first acts of leadership was to fill the vacant position of Judas Iscariot, 
who committed suicide after infamously betraying Jesus Christ. As reported in Acts 1 verse 13 to 26, Peter took the lead in selecting Matthias as the twelfth apostle. Early in his ministry, Peter performed a miracle at the temple called Beautiful that put him on notice among the Jewish leadership. As Acts 3 verses 1 to 10 reports, Peter and John were going to the temple for prayer when they encountered a man lame from birth who was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he would beg daily. On seeing the apostles, the man asked Peter and John for money. Peter, instead of giving money, said to him, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Peter then took the man by the hand and helped him up. Instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong, and he jumped up, began to walk, and then entered the temple courts with them, walking, jumping, and praising God. This miracle caused great amazement among the people in the temple area, providing Peter with an opportunity to preach about Jesus Christ and his resurrection at Solomon's porch. Hearing the teachings of Peter and John, the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees were greatly disturbed. Peter and John were arrested and put in jail until the next day, as it was evening. The next day, Peter and John were brought to be questioned by the high priest about their actions. Specifically, they wanted to know by what power or name they had healed the lame man. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter fearlessly addressed the Sanhedrin. He declared that the healing was done in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom they had crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Peter asserted that salvation is found in no one else but Jesus. These were the last things the council wanted to hear, but the Sanhedrin seeing the healed man, the evidence of God's power in action, standing with them, could not really say or do much in opposition. They could not deny the miracle, but they wanted to stop the spread of the apostles' teaching. They decided to command Peter and John not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. However, Peter and John replied that they must obey God rather than human beings, and that they could not help but speak about what they had seen and heard. After further threats, the Sanhedrin released them as they could not decide on a punishment, largely due to the presence of the crowd that witnessed the miracle. Peter was central in decision-making, teaching, and the administration of the early church. One of such was dealing with Ananias and Sapphira, Acts 5, verses 1 to 11. Ananias and Sapphira, a married couple in the early Christian community, sold a piece of property. Instead of contributing the full sale price to the community, as was the custom among the believers, they conspired to withhold part of the money while pretending to donate the entire amount. Ananias presented a portion of the money to the apostles. However, Peter, guided by divine insight, confronted Ananias about why he had lied to the Holy Spirit and kept back part of the money. Peter explained that while the property was theirs, they were not compelled to sell it or donate the proceeds. The deceit was not against humans, but against God. Upon hearing Peter's words, Ananias fell down abruptly and died. About three hours later, unaware of what had happened to her husband, Sapphira came in. Peter questioned her about the amount of money, giving her a chance to be truthful. However, she told the same lie. Peter then told her that she had tested the Spirit of the Lord and that the men who had buried her husband were at the door and she would be carried out as well. Immediately, she fell down at his feet and died. She was buried alongside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Not long after, Peter and the apostles again caught the attention of the Jewish leadership. Worried over the apostles' growing influence, the high priest ordered the arrest of Peter and the other apostles. They were put in jail, intended to be held for trial. However, during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and instructed them to go to the temple courts and continue teaching. The apostles obeyed. When the high priest and his associates convened the Sanhedrin and sent for the apostles in jail, 
they discovered the apostles were gone. They were later found teaching in the temple. They were brought back, and the high priest questioned them, reminding them of the previous orders not to teach in Jesus' name. Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The Sanhedrin, furious, wanted to put them to death right there and then, but they were counseled by Gamaliel, a respected Pharisee and teacher of the law, to be cautious. Gamaliel advised them to let the apostles go, suggesting that if their work was from God, it could not be stopped. The Sanhedrin took Gamaliel's advice, but not before having the apostles flogged. After the flogging, they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then released them. Peter and the apostles left the Sanhedrin, rejoicing, and counted themselves worthy of suffering for the name of Jesus. They continued to teach and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Shortly after, Peter had a strange encounter with a sorcerer named Simon. Simon was a sorcerer in Samaria who had amazed the people with his magic. He became a believer and was baptized when Philip preached the gospel in Samaria. Simon followed Philip, observing the signs and miracles performed. When Peter and John arrived Samaria, they prayed for the new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. Immediately, the believers received the Holy Spirit. Upon seeing this, Simon offered the apostles money, asking to buy this power so that he too could lay hands on others to receive the Holy Spirit. Taken aback, Peter rebuked Simon sharply, telling him that his heart was not right before God and that he could not buy the gift of God with money. Peter is now ready to face another important test that would have implications for all Gentile Christians. Cornelius, a centurion and a devout man in Caesarea, saw an angel in a vision telling him to send for Peter, who was staying in Joppa at the time. However, while Cornelius's messengers were en route, Peter had a vision. He saw the sky open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth, containing all kinds of animals, reptiles, and birds. A voice told him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Peter, a Jew, objected because the animals were unclean according to Jewish law. The voice replied, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit told him that Cornelius's messengers were looking for him and that he should go with them without hesitation. Peter met the messengers and went with them to Cornelius's house in Caesarea. Cornelius had gathered his relatives and close friends to meet Peter. Peter explained that it was against Jewish law for a Jew to associate with Gentiles, but that God had shown him he should not call anyone impure or unclean. Peter shared the gospel with them, explaining that God accepts people from every nation who fear him and do what is right. He spoke of Jesus Christ's ministry, death, and resurrection. While Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The Jewish believers with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Peter then ordered that Cornelius and his household be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. They were the first Gentile converts to Christianity. Peter and the apostles hardly had any respite. Soon enough, he was facing arrest again, this time from King Herod himself. King Herod Agrippa had begun persecuting members of the early church. He had James, the brother of John, executed, and seeing this pleased the Jewish leaders, he proceeded to arrest Peter as well during the festival of unleavened bread. Peter was imprisoned and guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him to trial after the Passover. Seeing their leader arrested, the church embarked on prayers on behalf of Peter. On the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. The angel struck Peter on the side to wake him up, told him to get up quickly, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. The angel instructed Peter to dress and follow him. Peter thought he was seeing a vision and didn't realize what was happening. They passed two guards, came to the iron gate leading to the city, which opened for them by itself, and they went out 
and walked down a street. Suddenly, the angel left him. Once Peter realized what had happened, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. When Herod found out Peter had escaped, he ordered the execution of the guards. Following the work of Apostle Paul with the Gentiles, the early church faced a significant debate about whether Gentile converts to Christianity needed to follow Jewish law, particularly circumcision, as per Mosaic law. The apostles and elders met in Jerusalem to discuss this issue. This council included key figures like Peter, Paul, Barnabas, and James. After much discussion, Peter stood up and addressed the assembly. He reminded them of the time God chose him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles so that they might hear and believe. Peter pointed out that God knew the hearts of the Gentile believers and had shown his acceptance by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he had to the Jewish believers. Peter argued against putting a yoke, referring to the Mosaic law, on the necks of the Gentile believers, which neither the ancestors nor the Jewish believers had been able to bear. He affirmed the belief that both Jews and Gentiles are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus. Peter's speech had a significant influence on the council's decision. James, who spoke after Peter, echoed his sentiments and recommended not to burden Gentile believers with unnecessary Jewish customs. The council agreed and decided to write a letter to Gentile believers, emphasizing abstention from idolatry, sexual immorality, and eating blood or meat of strangled animals but not imposing circumcision or the full Mosaic law. Apostle Peter's early work is extensive and is not fully documented. Although specific details are scarce, Peter continued to travel, preach, and spread the Christian faith. Some early sources suggest he may have ministered in various regions, including Asia Minor. Peter also wrote letters or epistles documenting some of his teachings. In the first epistle of Peter, or 1 Peter, he addressed the exiles scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The book of 1 Peter offers encouragement and guidance to Christians suffering persecution, emphasizing the themes of hope, the enduring word of God, and living a holy life amidst trials. In the second epistle of Peter, or 2 Peter, he warns against false teachers and encourages believers to grow in faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Importantly, he emphasized the certainty of Christ's return and the importance of living a godly life. Like many of the apostles, Peter was also killed for his service to God. According to early Christian tradition, Peter was martyred in Rome under Emperor Nero's reign around AD 64-68. He is said to have been crucified upside down at his own request, feeling unworthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. Apostle Peter is widely accepted to be buried in the Vatican Hill, where St. Peter's Basilica now stands. Archaeological and historical studies, particularly those conducted in the 20th century, have supported this belief. Excavations under St. Peter's Basilica in the 1940s revealed a necropolis dating back to Roman times. Within this area, a tomb was discovered which many scholars believe to be that of Apostle Peter. The tomb contained bones that were later subjected to forensic examination and were found to be those of a robust man in his 60s, which aligns with what is known about Peter. The Catholic Church views the Pope as the successor to St. Peter, who is considered the first bishop of Rome. Leadership of all Christian denominations agrees on how God used Peter to build and shape the Church of Christ. Peter's life, from a humble fisherman to a foundational apostle of Christianity, embodies transformation, faith, leadership, and redemption. Peter's letters have been integral to Christian doctrine and ethics, and his leadership and martyrdom have been inspirational to generations of Christians. Thank you for watching. This work required detailed analysis of several sections of the Bible. However, please note that we are not perfect. If we have made a mistake, Please be gentle in your brotherly correction. Please help us to continue this work by subscribing to our channel and liking this video. God bless you. Amen.